this week on Hermitcraft. So now I've been informed by cool guy Pixel Rift that you can insta mine vines with an efficiency five Frankensnatra. Oh my gosh, that is just blowing my mind. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap, my name is Pixel Rifts, our writer is XP. Captions on this video were provided by Liara, and the diamond or pillar competition has become a game of chess against a pigeon, meaning you can basically make up whatever rules you want because your opponent is probably just going to steal one of the pieces and fly away to build its nest. We'll just be lucky if nobody ends up pooping on the board. So far the events have been unfolding as follows. Grian has validated all the diamond pillars and invalidated all the other ones to make it clear that we're not messing around. Good Times with Scar has noticed that the ground under Grian's pillar is rather flimsy and witnessed it collapsing, which made the pillar quite a bit shorter looking. Grian retaliates by building a cannon out of diamond ore and shooting Scar's pillar with it, which you'd think would only add more diamond ore to the thing. In the meantime, Cubfan, Impulse and XB Crafted have joined forces, being the three players who've made their pillars out of your actual diamond blocks, to create arguably the most expensive tower so far which Good Times with Scar attempted to squash by literally dropping a diamond ore and deep slate anvil on it. Elsewhere, Pearlescent Moon is playing the stealth angle, building her pillar downwards from build height instead of up from the ground, but this hasn't escaped the notice of Doc M, who uses his considerable reserves of deep slate ore to bridge over and block her from going any further. So I guess this is what they do with all the money when they get this deep into the season without a proper shopping district. Luckily, the decision to move their commerce has finally been made, and a few hermits have already picked up their stores, only to put them down in a completely different place from where we were expecting. Instead of the mountain donuts they wanted to occupy previously, the group have decided to do their business in the woods. The shops will be placed in the Darkwood Forest clamped by the Spawn Town Mountains on one side and the Gigalogs Lumber Mill on the other. Maybe they'll get some commissions for chopping it all down, maybe they'll lose some clients because the logs are kind of everywhere anyway. We just hope the group doesn't change its mind again, False Symmetry already had to move her beans twice. So with all that out of the way, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Starting with Tango Tech, who has now completed the void box of the central nether hub room to the protest of the MP4 compression algorithm. The frame rate is insanely dropped though. Tango isn't on my best side right now, that's all we're gonna say. The Inky Darkness is populated by an assortment of magical buildings, forming a sharded library, and also by piglins when the mob switch stops working. Either pops real good against the starry backdrop. Mmm, you're not supposed to be here. Wish I haven't carried weapons in like three days. The hub part of the build are the four corridors leading out in the primary directions, which are meant to reach out to Hermit's personal bases, and will come in real handy now that the Hermits are actually building those. For example, Azumavoid has declared that his mega base this season will be a giant skeleton you can fly down, which is going to be hard to execute once Monkey Farm from Season 2 comes to take his giant skull back. Zloy, it's been eight years. So that's why Azuma has been pillaring with bone blocks, of all things. He has a few, but also will need a lot more. In the meantime, there are farms to build, and X focuses on applying the scaffolding technology to a bad omen and pillager farm. It comes out pretty tall and really yellow. And after a few minutes of AFKing, we've got a ridiculous amount of them. You can see that because they've all bundled up into corners. Good Times with Scar chooses to go pretty and pink. The recent prank by Cubvan and Rendog really highlighted that his shop in a tree would look good with vibrant foliage, and so Scar puts on a woolen foliage to help the tree really blossom. But I am just riding on a high of finally getting this done, and I think it is a really nice contrast from the rest of the trees, which just make up a giant green blob. Spare Wool goes to stock the Matador mattress store, though helps none with the sign for it. The Ravager mascot is perpetually stuck showing its butt to passers-by, and Scar won't have it. With Cubfan's help, they successfully pacify the pillager riding him and trap the steed in a cage of glass panes it can't figure a way out of. I'm here with the noise department. You don't like the vibe? <laughs> Come, we scared everyone off to go build their, me their mega bases with how loud this sound is. Really? <laughs> Hold on, let me turn it. In case it misbehaves, Scar also now has a trident thanks to Pearlescent Moon, who uses him to road test the concept of her new shop for the shopping district. Think of it as a recycling center shop for the junk that people actually find valuable, because one person's trash is another person's slow falling potion. Yeah. And a very rare thing that you can put on your shelf. <gasps> hold on, hold on. I those, have those, ears. Literally, the, one of those is mine. And speaking of potions, Pearl decides to add a touch of atmosphere to the store by splashing visitors with stink particles when they arrive. But so the smell can really linger, she decides only the stuff that's been fermenting in Dragon's Breath will do. Which is bad news if you're a dragon. Bop, bop, boo! Time to go brew some bin juice. 
She's in good company right next door to iIlluminate, which now has a community designed and impulse refined map art sign, which is actually eight connected maps because this server has no chill. But that's okay. Um, it, it still looks pretty good, I think. Flare outside the shop and gives us some character. How cool is that? What it does have is a whole bunch of light sources, and Impulse redesigns the ground floor to be a showroom for all things fluorescent, from end rods to sea pickles. This means the shop itself is now upstairs, signposted by magenta arrows, along with actual signposts. Considering Impulse can sell anyone a beard, we're pretty sure it'll be a success. And the bearded theme continues as he designs two dwarven statues to go either side of the doorway to his empire keep. One of them has a giant hammer, which is appropriate now we all know where the giant anvil ended up. Ha! Huh. They're still in the lead. They're still higher than us. I am in shock. While he's still working on the next custom dungeon experience, B00 needs to get his foot in the shopping district game already. And with Scar already having put beds on the market, B dubs taps one of his other passions, his affinity for moss blocks. Redstoning up a stone generator moss farm, he builds the store around it, pausing only to kill Gemini Tay for Prismarine. Yes! And Mossomenos takes shape, although he's still not sure how to link the name back into the overall shopping experience. He'll have plenty of time for fresh air and contemplating that while he's riding around on his newest mount. Does this give Come you memories? Sticks. Huh? <laughs> it's just like last season. Oh, two blocks would be enough for you. Two, yeah, yeah, two blocks would totally be enough for me. Mm -hmm. This would not be the only business decision of Corrales's this week, as he visits Rendog's sapling farm to increase the Gigalog stock, and I just want this clip of this line documented for future reference. So I did ask Grant how this operates, and he said it's very simple. You can't really break anything. At the main store, Corrales brings the lumber mill to life, with more tractors and other vehicles you would expect at such a place, once again demonstrating his affinity for industrial machinery builds. And then he also becomes a plane for a bit, but that's something we'll get into later. All the oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, you're both hit! Oh, they're both uh. hit! Rendog, in the meantime, will get into False's Giant Eagle for some clandestine tinted glass deals. He's also been crafting it himself on the side, because his super productive new creeper farm needs some privacy glass. Thanks to a drone camera view, we're able to see it from all angles as he time-lapse builds the multi-platform monstrosity and bubble-vators it all the way to AFK height, where the creepers will be offloaded into campfires and drop the goods into the hoppers below. All that's left is the giant Gigacorp sign, and presumably a sand quarry somewhere, because he'll need a lot of TNT for the real tree farming work to begin in earnest. Giving us a total of 42 stacks of gunpowder, or 2,688 gunpowder per hour. Which, uh, I have no idea if that is like a really good rate or not, but 42 stacks is probably more than enough to keep the Hexadeca chopper up and running. Gemini Tay, by comparison, starts a video with the words, that's a nice forest, it'd be a shame if something happened to it. Spoiler, it is a shame, she clears it all out. The corners of her base are decided and the towers rise in their place, only to be met with snow layers and other minor inconveniences. It's a cold biome after all. I promise I won't just complain about it, although I will complain about it probably a lot. We also find out who's up for murder on the server. Long story short, it's everyone. Gosh, I asked for a murder oh, and you guys you, come flying. You Yes, 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 love to blunt. <laughs> XB, Corrales, and Hypno are no exception. To round up the Octodrop competition, XB suggests the two finalists show down for the grand prize in an aerial dogfight. Somehow they both win, or lose, the best of three competition, and after they've split the prize, they invite Vintage Beef over to be hit by a bubble column's worth of arrows. <laughs> <laughs> Go up naked! <laughs> Go up naked! <laughs> Get him! No, it does like zero damage. Uh, oh. yeah, it I think only damage. only I'm one arrow why. one arrow hits you at a time. I don't think a lot of them do at the same time. Dang it. XB returns to his base to give us a spectacular shaders showcase, then expands the story so far by setting up doused campfire walkways around the giant train carriage and introducing a new entrance to it accessed by staircase. That being said, according to all known laws of aviation, a hypnotized was never supposed to fly. Hypno builds a bee farm this week. I'm sorry if that was too subtle a hint. Really, the bee nests were there already, and the primary development here is the giant yellow hexagon housing it. It's meant to be honeycombed to better accommodate the bees into cross-pollination, in lieu of jazz and all. But yeah, overall, I think this farm is turning into something, at least. <laughs> it looks way better than what it did before. Well, this just means the giant bee false symmetry builds will have something to call a home. This is apparently how False decided to announce to the server that she's got honey blocks available. The bee resides over the new and improved False Bean Store, a not only relocated, but also bigger and better ore shop for all your weird texture needs. Unless it's the stuff she buys off XB or Rendog, that she has no farm for yet. 
Well, see, this is supposed to be a super secret rendezvous. Yeah, this is. It's You've, not. It's not very secret. You've totally given it away now. Yeah. Jeez. Oh yeah. <laughs> Speaking of farms yet to be, we get to see the behind the scenes at the Hall of Goat as Doc M77 loads up his creative copy of the world to show us the outline of the largest possible drowned farm he can build in his perimeter. So pretty huge area um, we have here and this will be used for the drowned farm. The output of the farm will be insane and it will be a two-man farm. We will need two players to run it. But the good thing is we do one or two good overnight sessions and then we should have stock uh, of copper for weeks. He also gives us a preview of some community designed copper goat statues, which he builds on the server with the promise of them flanking a throne later. But his main task is getting started on the bane of a redstoner's existence, an automatic amethyst shard farm. Doc's approach, prompted by Il Mango, involves making a 90s game show style moving wall to shave off crystals from the faces of each block. But this game of 3D Tetris is just one part of the puzzle, because if he wants to max out his crystal output, he has to do the same thing for two other sides of the geode as well. And then over time, we should build up a considerable supply of um, crystals here. <laughs> In our cave. On the topic of geological marvels, a time lapse of Grian relocating the entity shop shows clearly that it has fleshy red innards, which is frankly the best kind of awful when combined with the fact that it also has skittery spider legs. Good job, sir, you let a cryptid into the woods. Not even a single one, mind you. Grian's solution to elevating the customers into the pulsating underbelly is to get them shot at with a live shulker, which of course is nothing short of a nightmare to transport into the overworld. Okay, I went through. Yeah, he didn't. A few failed runs, a cub fan, and a lot of elbow grease later, it does actually happen. A shulker is buried under the entity. Maybe not the easiest, but surely a stylish elytra launcher. Please tell me it's not going to run out before I even get there. No! 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 Just another illustration in how nice it is to have a world record speedrunner on your side. Which yes, Cubfan is now, having now validated his world record in the mineral run category for Minecraft. And that world record has now been verified, so we are now officially the fastest person to ever get all the minerals in the game on a random seed without using structures to boost us. Uh, that means we went through the entire tech tree uh, and gathered all the minerals faster than anyone ever has. So that's pretty cool. Just wanted to let you guys know about that. Though with the opening of his next shop, his mining days are over. Now he's got a speed run to the nearest forest and fetch you some leaves and moss and other green colored stuff. It's going to be great. We're going to sell most of the items that are green and are not aquatic, so for instance, not like seagrass over there. By contrast, Jevin deals mostly in reds and blacks, adding an end ship to his end city bartering hall in the nether. Don't know what kind of elytra should be in it for accuracy. Now to fuel the piglins, Jevin just needs a gold farm over the top of the nether roof and a fun way to get the things from one to another. Pretty good. So we got a good amount of gold nuggets to start off with. Yeah, because we don't have a lot of bartering though, I don't think it makes too much difference. Vintage beef pops up everywhere despite mostly staying in one place. He's been grinding for more effects cards and attempting a pallet swap for B00, but he might still keep the old versions in circulation as rare cards. So now you can shiny hunt on Hermitcraft as well, I guess. Are you gonna like hide them anywhere or is it, how do we get them? Purchasing, uh, but Buy there'll them. be other ways to get them as well. Ah. And then you go back five seconds later I didn't get the ones I want. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. More, more. <laughs> if you're interested in how the game will be played, iJevin gets a beef summary of the rules when he drops by, and Jevin isn't the only visitor to the map art area. Well, I'm going to put my Herman in defense mode. <laughs> <laughs> Tango drops off a whole bunch of beacons, bringing Joe and Cleo in his wake. Last of all, Beef takes another trip to challenge Zedaf in the Hall of All, only this time Zedaf's had a lot more time to gather the obscure and notable blocks. I'm hoping you overlooked it. Just an empty map. map. Just an empty map. Interesting. Beef, I'm going to have to have a look around. I got it! Ah, oh, dang right it! There. He instead obtains obscure and notable people. Having expanded the pumpkin production of his base, Zed realizes he'll need more farmer villagers. Every kind of them kind of more. It is a challenge, granted his base is neither a jungle nor a swamp, and these types of villagers only appear when bred in those biomes. However, after the business at Lake Honk, Zed should be pretty good at the art of idiot wrangling. And another one, and now we have nearly two stacks of, of emeralds. Did I say diamonds? I meant emeralds. I don't know. This thing. Having been called out one too many times for his villager breeder lagging out spawn, Iskal resolves to do even more with villagers. This time though, he installs a weighted pressure plate to measure when there are 15 villagers already waiting and shut off the breeder from producing any more. 
Add a zombie employee and a little minecart redstone and you've got yourself a new supply of cheap traders, which he ties artfully into the environment of his lush cave as long as you pay no attention to the mess behind the curtain. Because it's very easy to get carried away. Yes, 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 this area... Oh, this area looks so much better now. And finally, there's Mumbo, and if you tuned in for last week's recap, you'll already know about Grian's attempt to warp his way into Mumbo's decoy vault. I mean, he's gonna kill himself! The man's gonna kill himself just on my wall! What is he doing? I mean, this is- this is chaos! But that's only half the story, and seeing it from Mumbo's perspective really brings home how calculated the whole scheme was. Which means he's ready to start working on his actual vault door, and he liked the decoy vault design enough that he scales it up. We know for a fact that Grian coughs up five blocks of diamond as part of the bargain, so we also know Mumbo has some stuff to put in the vault once it's done. And to peek behind the curtain for just a second, the recipe prompt appears once Grian hands over those diamond blocks, which kind of implies Mumbo hasn't actually held a diamond block at any previous point in the season. Of course, like the rest of the server, he's probably got it all tied up in diamond ore blocks. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixelriffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here, and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.